All right, everybody. So the last lecture, a couple of things happened. Last lecture, we started talking about um, pi effects, the sigma plus pi picture, or the sigma only picture, pi bonding picture. So we introduced um, what happens when you have high interaction, and specifically, we talked about how the angle is. Um, and we did this using a sigma only picture and a sigma plus pi picture. We take that approach because pi bonding is less significant than sigma bonding. So the strength of the interaction and the splittings are smaller. And you can think about pi bonding as kind of a perturbation on sigma. Um, and you know, we consider this case where the d orbitals are empty and the d orbitals are filled. We talked about the differences between those two. You know, the most useful way I think to envision that is to think about an electrostatic kind of a picture. Um, when you take two lone pairs and you bring them up to each other, you get a repulsive interaction overall, right? You consider those two lone pairs as your basis set and you make a bonding and anti-bonding combination. Two electron pairs, one goes down, one goes up. It turns out the one that goes up goes up a little bit more than the one that goes down. And so, you know, overall it's energetically unfavorable to make that connection. But the, the thing that you should remember, the, the more important issue that you're going to face and try to understand in this class is what happens to the ionization energy. Right? So when you push two electron pairs together, one goes down and one goes up, what is the ionization energy of the molecule that you're making? It's defined, typically we talk about the first ionization energy. Right? So it's the higher of those two levels that energy is higher than the starting lone pairs. So by pushing the two electrons on top of each other, unsurprisingly, the energy of the first ionization is easier. The level goes up, it approaches this vacuum, it's easier to rip an electron out. You force negative charge on top of itself, one of those negative charges really wants to get out of that situation, right? That's how you think about this. So if you have an electron pair on a ligand, an electron pair on a metal, you force them on top of each other, that creates a high density of negative charge. And the molecule wants to get rid of a charge compared to where it was, or compared to a case without that repulsive interaction. Similarly, if you have an empty orbital on a metal and a filled orbital on a ligand, that's like minus and plus. That stabilizes the electrons, makes it harder to pull an electron off. That picture is really simple and intuitive. That's acid base chemistry at the most basic level. We're going to use that idea in MO diagrams. So we're going to think about the symmetry of the orbitals interacting and for all these lines on the page and whatever. But don't forget about the plus and the minus and the minus and the minus. Right? That's where that's the simple thing you can use to check your answer or understand the diagram. You got to make that connection between the diagram and this. Okay, so who is more, more easily ionized? Ammonia or hydrazine? Hydrazine is the one with two lone pairs. So it's an NN bonded thing. It's N2H4, right? So the two lone pairs are interacting with each other. That's a high density of negative charge compared to ammonia, which only has one lone pair. The hydrazine is very electron rich. There's a high density of charge. It's easily ionized. It's explosive, that stuff, because of that. Well, not just because of that. But that concentration of negative charge raises the energy of the electrons. Now, uh, Okay, 
So let's do them first. All right. So last time we talked about pi dollar interactions, but actually a lot of ligands are pi acceptors. What's a pi acceptor? Same picture, except the ligand has the source of positive charge or the empty orbital. So let's let's talk about those examples here. Um, so I forgot to do this also. So let's take a look at some high dollar ligands. O2 minus an oxide, oxido. This thing is the one of the most potent pi donors out there. F minus the halide, all of them. We talked about NR2 minus, right? Those is sigma, one of those is pi. Violate. Pretty good pi donor. All right, we can imagine other ones, but those are some of the classics. <clears throat> Think about how many electrons are sitting on all those ligands here around the metal. These kinds of ligands go together with metals that don't have any electrons. Gives rise to the best stabilization. The metal's got the electrons, you've got a destabilization issue. Right? So these type of ligands, they, they tend to stabilize high oxidation states. I'll say and. Metals with low D electron count. We haven't found much D electron count. An example of a metal with a low D electron count. This tantalum five amido compound. Where's tantalum? Vanadium, niobium, tantalum. It's right next to titanium, zirconium, and hafnium. Titanium, zirconium, and hafnium are important columns. A lot of chemistry with those elements. Those have four D electrons. Vanadium, niobium, tantalum have five D electrons. When you put five NR2 ligands and you make a pentavalent tantalum center, there are no D electrons left. Okay, so this is a good situation. You've got a bunch of pi donors and you've got a tantalum center that has no D electrons. So this tantalum is a good acid. permanganate uh, anion. What color is permanganate? Beautiful purple color. Hard to forget permanganate. Where's mang manganese? Manganese just to the left of iron. Iron, ruthenium, and osmium have eight D electrons. That's another important column, remember. Iron, ruthenium, and osmium, they have eight D electrons. Manganese is just one to the left of iron. It has seven D electrons. This manganese seven compound has no D electrons. Very good for making pi bonds with those oxo ligands. Right, and then uh, chloride, hexachloropyridate. Okay, sorry, that's not very clear. Let me chloride is it? Brilliant hexachloride. Six chlorides, 
two of them account for this negative charge. That's a little weak math on that. So that means four of them modify the valence of this iridium center. Iridium four. How many electrons for iridium to begin with? Nine. Iridium is in the cobalt, rhodium, iridium column. In between iron, ruthenium, osmium, and group 10, which is nickel, palladium, platinum. It's a nice little box there. Cobalt, rhodium, iridium, those guys have nine electrons. So this iridium center has five D electrons. It's actually kind of a lot. All right, it's not much of a pi donor, though. All right, anyway, so pi donors like metals with high oxidation states. Let's talk about pi acceptors. You have the inverse situation, as I said. It's a pi acceptor. Classic pi acceptor ligand. They're sometimes called pi acids. And the classic example is CO. There are others. Isonitrile to do one. Phosphorus trifluoride, PF3, another one. So, how does CO act as a pi acid? So, there's a couple of orbitals that we're going to be interested in here. We're going to take a metal and think about its dz squared orbital. They're interacting with the carbon monoxide. An oxide has a filled orbital with a lone pair in it that donates to an empty DZ squared. Right? It's one that, that forms the sigma bond. So this is an sp hybridized lone pair still making up the sigma interaction. And then there are two others. There's DYZ, which is going to be filled in our example. DYZ, this is the Z axis. So we'll make Y the plane of the board. There's DYZ, and it's going to have two electrons in it. And then we're going to line this thing up with the carbon monoxide. And this carbon monoxide is going to have an empty orbital of pi symmetry. That is it turned out to be the pi star orbital of the CO ligand. Pi star along the y direction. This is empty. I mean, that's how CO can act as a pi acid. There's another one down here. DXC. So it makes a connection to a carbon monoxide. Sorry, I should have colored these in the other way. Apologize for that. This is going to be a Draw the bonding interaction here. It doesn't really matter, but this is the more important one. Okay, so we got a lone pair in these two orbitals now pointing at the pi star level. Oh my goodness. Okay, so this pi star. This is the anti-bonding combination of two orbitals on the CO, right? These guys are out of phase with each other. There's a node running along here, which is anti-bonding on the carbon monoxide. It's empty. An electron pair can donate into that pi symmetry orbital on the CO. Remember how CO is hypovalent. Right? We're not drawing out all the formal charges here, but 
one of the Lewis representations you could write. That one, right? That's the hypovalent depiction. And this guy is in resonance with the triply bonded form. I think if you stare at those things long enough, you'll see carbon monoxide is electron deficient. Right? The one on top, there's not enough electrons around the carbon in the first place. The one on the bottom, you've got a plus charge out there on oxygen. CO is electron deficient. It acts as a sigma donor, but it also acts as a pi acid, meaning plus charge here in this orbital accepts this Lewis base. The metal is the Lewis base attacking this Lewis acid using a pi symmetry orbital. So when you make an interaction like this, you can get multiple resonance forms here. I'm going to draw this to start. That's one way to write a CO complex. Remember, in cobalt hexamine, we don't draw the formal charges. We typically don't draw the formal charges when we draw this structure either. So you'll see this kind of thing all over the place. The charges are not depicted, but they're there. And this thing is in resonance. This one. What happened? What do we do? Um, the electrons from the CO bond went onto the oxygen, and then the electrons from the metal went into the MC bond. Yes. So the electrons from the metal kind of appeared out here. Right? The CO provides a conduit for electrons to flow out toward the oxygen. This actually makes a lot of sense. Structures like this are really, can be a very good depiction, particularly for a metal that is very, that is very electropositive. Right? Something like titanium or hafnium or tantalum with electrons, extra electrons. That's like, you're talking like magnesium and potassium. <laughs> Anything oxide, it's not crazy. All right, so it happens in a push pull kind of a fashion. The lone pair from the CO donates to the metal, and the metal donates electrons back to the pi orbitals. They work together to make that multiple bond. Okay. Yeah. So, how, I guess, would we know how many electrons? Very good question. This is a matter of degrees, all right? So these are resonance structures, which means they're the limiting forms of something, right? So, you know, if you said, what color is this? Somebody might say, well, it's blue, but somebody else would say, it's red. Well, really it's kind of purplish. It's a mixture of blue, right? Ah, it's mostly blue. Question is, what color is it? Yeah, that's what you're, what you're asking me. These are sort of the limiting structures, right? Somewhere in between. Well, what is it for a given transition metal complex? Depends upon the metal, depends upon what the other limits are. So we'll go through and we'll work through some of those ideas. But you have to be able to analyze how electropositive the metal is, um, you know, what's its oxidation state, for instance, how many like, the electrons does it have? Yeah. Um, if uh, carbon monoxide is so uh, electron deficient, wouldn't it make more sense if you have an electronegative metal that would bond to the oxygen instead of the carbon? Good thought. Uh, so that does happen. 
Uh, it turns out to be very difficult to prove, <laughs> but it does happen. Um, it happens for metals that are extremely uh, oxophilic, but it's like a rare, very rare type of event. You know, when the metal binds, particularly metals with the electrons, you're essentially fixing the valence problems on carbon. And you know, carbon monoxide is a very poisonous gas. It's also very flammable. It reacts with oxygen very vigorously, which seems a little counterintuitive if you think about it as being electron deficient. So is the oxygen. But why is it so reactive? It's reactive because you make a new structure that's much more stable. Carbon dioxide is really downhill, right? You're starting with this energetic thing and it fixes itself by getting oxidized, even though it's electron deficient. It's a little bit confusing. When you add the metal, particularly a metal with the electrons, you make this multiple bond that really stabilizes the situation because it fixes the valence problem. Okay, so let's draw this stuff out in molecular orbital terms here. If we have a metal, we have a carbon monoxide ligand. We're going to take some orbitals on the metal and orbitals on the CO and mix them. And the relevant ones here are one, two, three, four, five metal based orbitals. Let's put them on D square, X squared minus Y squared. Now, where are we going to put the CO orbitals? Why lower? That's the ionization energy of the ligands compared to the metal most of the time. We have a slightly different situation here. Okay, and this is an important detail to remember. You're going to have a carbon monoxide lone pair down here. You can have a pair of high star CO orbitals up here. I've been telling you all along the ligands are beneath the metal. So, what happened? This is an antibonding orbital, it's a pi star orbital, right? Think about the CO like in the ripple diagram, the bonding one, this thing actually is non-bonding approximately. Actually, it's like this like the antibonding, we'll see in a little while. Um, but you know, it's approximately non-bonding. And like any other lone pair, it's near the orbital energy of the carbon. This thing is anti-bonding, so it's been split. This bonding one somewhere down here also. You got this MO diagram for the CO fragment next to the metal. The anti bonding orbitals get pushed way up relative to their normal starting point. This is a case where the ligand is above the metal almost always. For purposes of the class, it's always above the metal. Okay? That's because it's the anti bond. All right, so let's give this metal some D electrons. How about four? Let's make some bonds. What kind of a bond is this? What type of bond is that? Sigma orbital, right? This is the metal ligand sigma bond. This is the metal ligand. Our level. And now, we're also going to make a pi bond. This is the pi symmetry metal ligand orbital. And this is the Okay, 
So we took a pi star orbital on the CO and we made a pi bond with it. So we're going to call this one pi bonding and this one pi antibonding. We're talking now about the metal ligand interaction, not the CO inter by itself. And four electrons. Let's put four electrons in here. Let's take these and put them down there. See how I did that? This one's closer to that guy. So I'm going to talk about this one kind of like it's the CO. And then the next one up is going to be the metal. These are like the D electrons on the metal dropping relative to where they were. That happens because the CO is a pi acid and that positive charge stabilizes the electrons. It's harder to pull them out so they drop. And they're still kind of like the D electrons. This is still kind of like the CO pi one. It's really a sigma and a pi orbital, bonding orbital. And then we've got two others we get here. Okay, so CO pi star starts higher than the metal. Any other pi star orbital that we're going to talk about making pi bonds with metals also going to start higher than the metal. Okay. Any other pi donors, lone pairs, lower than the metal. Got to remember that. All right, because CO pi stars stabilize electrons on the metal lower their ionization energy, you typically find these kinds of ligands on complexes that are electron rich. They have a lot of electron pairs to give. And uh, they're typically low oxidation states. So chromium hexacarbon is a good example. Manganese hexacarbon anion. This anion, you got four neutral CO ligands with one anion. The oxidation state here is considered to be minus one. Okay. All right. So if I give you a metal with a pi donor and a metal with a pi acceptor, and I ask you which one is going to be more easily ionized, all things considered, you know, being otherwise equal, which one is which one's more easily ionized, pi donor or pi acceptor? Mm -hmm. The donor is more easily ionized. Ionization energy is a measure of how electron rich the compound is. When you have a pi donor, you're adding density, you're adding electron richness. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this. So we're going to do some more. Again. A lot of ways to represent transition level complex. Localized pictures are usually what we do. We draw lines. Make blue structures. We've already done sigma only over and over again. We talked about two different types. We've got covalent and we've got data. We've got pi donors. Now, Typically, we talk about resonance structures where we take this covalently bonded compound, and we're going to make a data of interaction with a lone pair. Okay. What did we do there? This resonance depiction pushes the electron pair off of the nitrogen and into this pi bond. 
need things homolytically to measure the formal charges. When you push that electron pair off of the nitrogen onto the metal, you get a plus on nitrogen. Same situation. Things like iodide. Okay. Iodide can be a pi donor, it's got electron pairs. In fact, it has two of them. You can write structures like that. Now that doesn't really make a lot of sense for iodide, right? Drawing a two plus on the halide does not feel very good. But things like oxo now you got a negative charge out here and i'm going to put a positive charge in here because i want to start with neutral compounds just for the sake of making the math straightforward right it's basically people would say that these two things are isoelectronic because they have the same number of valence electrons and the same types of orbitals so you can draw these same resonance depictions Uh, a nice doubly bonded oxo. Or triply bonded oxo. One on the bottom, right down there, often the best resonance structure. Two pi symmetry lone pairs on the oxo can make two bond, pi bonds of the metal. Just like we did for carbon, that carbon monoxide. Oxos are often triply bonded. Tempting to write the doubly bonded form because it looks like a carbonyl compound in this version. Usually, very often, the one below the right. And the doubly bonded forms that you find in nature and be very reactive. The triply bonded ones. Tend to be more stable. Okay, so Last, we've got our pi acceptors. I'm going to put some lone pairs on my metal so I can make some pi bonds. And again, I've chosen to show the formal charges here. Normally, we don't. In these sorts of a situation, it's very instructive. Now we've taken one little pair, pushed it onto carbon, and then we push this triple bond off onto oxygen to make sure things are obeying the octet. Neutral compound. One that we did before, we push the second lone pair off of the metal and out to the oxygen. Which one is it? Depends upon the metal. See things all the way across this range, actually. Here's another one. PF3. And I've got some formal charges here. Normally, when we write 
PR3 or NH3 or NR3, don't write the formal charges, but we're going to do it in these examples to make everything look right. This PF3 is a pretty good pi acceptor. So you can write things like this. Some of you will be triggered by the structure and say, wait a second, the phosphorus is not obeying the octet rule here. You should be marked wrong, Professor Nolan. Draw the other one. There's the natural residence depiction. So this is hypervalent depiction here, hypervalent phosphorus. PF3 acts as a pi acceptor. How does it do that? Kind of useful thinking about CO or molecules that have multiple bonds having a pi orbital and a pi star orbital. But how does PF3 act as a pi acceptor? Where does that come from? Well, what type of orbital on phosphorus has the right symmetry to make pi bond? Think about PF3. Phosphorus. 3P. 3P, there you go. It better be a P orbital. It's not going to be an S, that doesn't have pi symmetry. It's not going to be the D D orbitals for phosphorus. It's got to be a P orbital. So, what orbital in the PF3 molecule uses the P3? Sorry, the 3P. What does phosphorus use the 3P for when making PF3? If you just thought about PF3 for a second. PF3. Remember Bent's rule, right? PF3 has a lone pair. Bent says, well, that's mostly a pure S. Right? These angles are probably close to 90 degrees. These FPF angles because the phosphorus, sorry, the fluorine is so electronegative, and the phosphorus 3P is much more easily ionized than the 3S. So the best situation is for the lone pair to be pure S and for the phosphorus to use pure P's and making a bond to fluorine. So that P orbital is making a bond to fluorine. Fluorine is a hog, it takes all the electron density, leaves behind it. A lot of positive charge in the phosphorus, and particularly in those three p derived orbitals. It's a molecular orbital that includes the phosphorus three p, and it's the sigma orbital for sigma star. The sigma star is the empty one. Okay, so this phosphorus has sigma star orbitals that are empty. They can accept. Electron density from the metal by making a pi bond. It's just like making the pi star interaction that's drawn over there. Empty orbital on the ligand. It's anti bonding on the ligand. The metal dumps electrons into it. Same situation. The sigma star is a pi symmetry. Except electrons from the metal. Okay. So typically we, we draw these kinds of pictures. Professor can I ask you a question? Yeah. So if it has more S character, if it's just by itself, I'm talking about the phosphorus, I mean the three phosphorus on, on the uh, I'm sorry, phosphorus with the three forms. According to Bits rule, you're saying that because of the electronegativity, the, the the bonds are almost at 90 degrees. So the S character for the lone pair is it's almost S character. But the S orbital is not pi bond, right? So 
That's right. What are you saying when you say that the lone pair that's there, the antibind, the sigma star, the constant star, you're saying it's pi binding, but it's a sigma star. It's a sigma star orbital on the PF3 fragment. The pi star orbital on the CO fragment has the right symmetry to make a pi bond to the metal. The sigma star orbital on the PF3 fragment has the right symmetry to make a pi bond. All right, so you're going to see a lot of this, okay? But there are other types of ways to represent bonding. No complexes, and <clears throat> one of them is uh. Uh, what's called valence bond theory. This is hybridization theory. And it's um, minus Pauling's approach. Pauling, he was a pretty important character. Read a lot of articles saying, ah, oh, yeah, go back and look at Pauling's old text. He explained all this stuff and predicted it way before anybody was thinking about it. Pauling seemed to know what was going on. And what Pauling said about metal ligand complexes was, hey, they're hybridized just like carbon. And this metal uses a D2 sp3 orbital. By D2 sp3, well, Pauling said, all right, you got six orbitals here, six, six metal ligand bonds. Each one's going to be made of a hybrid orbital. You take two Ds and S, two Ps, and poof, you got six equivalent orbitals. And this sort of a picture is a sort of a localized picture. Right. In methane, CH3 is a local CH sp3 hybridized CH4 is a localized representation. All four bonds are equivalent until you take the total electron spectrum. And then you say, well, wait a minute, there's different electron energies in the methane. So Pauling said our course. See that here too. There is another theory called crystal field theory. This was a um, a theory that was developed by, say, geologists, people, chemists thinking about gemstones, really. All interactions are ionic. Crystals like ruby, or sapphire, what are the other ones? Um, there's a number of them. They're all alumina. Alumina is just aluminum oxide. It makes a very stable crystal. And if you force a transition metal in there, the transition metal now lives in this environment that's defined by the alumina and has oxygen ligands, super rigid, um, and you get wonderful colors. The colors come from the transition metals. Alumina itself is colorless, sapphire, incredibly strong stuff, totally clear, colorless. Put some metals in there, you get interesting things. A geologist studied this stuff for a long time. Chemists studied this stuff, and they 
came up with the crystal field theory where all of the interactions come from these O2 minus ions. And they sit around the metal in some sort of symmetry. That depending upon what your crystal is, you have different ligands around it. And the metal has a, a delta plus charge, and the ligand has a delta minus charge. So, this picture actually still contaminates the way we think about. Uh, transition metal complexes today. Remember, how I've been telling you it's like metal plus ligand minus. So <clears throat> the interactions are all ionic. There's this sort of field of point charges that has some arrangement around the metal. Um, and then finally, there's something called ligand field. <clears throat> Ligand field theory is based on the LCAO approach. This is a molecular orbital theory. And the bonding is delocalized. localized bonding, but it has covalent character. Okay, this is a very ionic picture. All plus and minus. You can also think about something intermediate, which is to have delocalized bonding. That means many of the ligands combining together to make molecular orbitals rather than Pauling's localized picture. Um, but it involves some covalency. It's not just ionic. So this is sort of how we tend to think about transition metals these days. This stuff was like these two crystal field theory and Pauling's we're talking about starting in the first half of the 20th century and, and continuing up into the 70s. Okay, so There are a lot of people fighting about all that stuff. You know, people get married to a way of thinking and they can't get out. They're stuck with it. All of their pictures of the world are based on these sort of underlying principles and they can't let go of them and they're stuck making all kinds of strange conclusions. So trying to rip somebody's basic picture out of their mind and replace it with another one requires pretty massive editing of the rest of their world. So let's do, we're going to do the sigma only picture here. This is the Lincoln field theory picture for ML6C, and we're going to do this in octahedral. It doesn't have to be octahedral, but we're going to do it in octahedral. And we're really interested in the in things like hydride here, ammonia, water, etc. Really talking about transition metals going from zero up to six. What does this mean here? D zero to D six. Yeah, it's the number of D electrons that aren't used 
uh, that haven't been used to make sigma bonds. And particularly things like P plus, this is the one. And these examples, we have a couple of the electrons on the metal, those are going to become important for our discussion later. And we're going to do some group theory on complexes of this kind. Now, we're going to take our metal. Bunch of orbitals around this metal or ligand bases, right? And we're going to figure out what an octahedral symmetry, what the reducible representation is, which we're going to call six ligand sigma. Six ligand sigma is the ligand basis orbitals here. This is here. Take a second. Eight C three and six C two. Think for a moment. How are we going to do this? How do we determine this? You don't, you don't have to shout it out. Ask yourself if you know for a minute. I like the enthusiasm, but I, this is something that people need to go through the motions on. Have it. And we've got all these operations, reducible representation. We're asking, we need to figure out what the characters are here. How do we do that? How many people know how to do that? Raise your hand, please. How many people know? So, somebody want to tell me? What about somebody other than Ethan? Or Jordan? Um, you have to do the operation and see um, if the, if you do the operation and if you lose, if, if it moves, it goes off the diagonal. Contributes to zero, right? And that doesn't move to one. Yeah. So th this somebody wisely pointed out to me. This is not totally a fair description to say it goes off the diagonal and contributes to zero, but that's how I remember it. Um, if it moves when you do the operation, it contributes to zero. If it doesn't move, it contributes to one. Okay. So let's do these operations. The do nothing operation. Nobody moves. Everybody contributes to one. How many basis orbitals are we doing? Six. So we're going to have six here. Where is C3 in octahedral? We're going to rotate this guy and exchange these three and these three. Kind of hard to explain where C3 is, but yeah, it changes these guys and these guys. So one C3 is going to move every single one of these ligand orbitals. So what is the character under C3? Everybody moves, nobody contributes a one. You get a zero. Do all of them. Six, zero, two, two. Conversion, everybody gets a zero, zero. Well, did I miss somebody here? No, I didn't. So there's your reducible representation. Now what do we do with that? What is that good for? Well, we 
want to know the symmetries that you can get. What are the mini matrices that you can get? What are the symmetries that make up six ligand segment? One of the ways you can do that is using the formula that we gave. Another way is by inspection. What's another way? My favorite way. Like the orbital dynamics. Okay, and what would be an example of how you do that? So, for example, if you're thinking about mapping, if you think about how oh, we have a test orbital and we have a test orbital, and these two things bond with each other, these are right. geometries, and we know the point groups of or the, the irreducible interpretations of each of these orbitals are going to happen. That's right. To get a bond, you have to have the same symmetry. So, if you say, all right, I know there's an S orbital and it's going to make a bond. What's the symmetry of the S orbital on the central atom? You go look at it on the table and you say, all right, well, probably the ligand combination is going to have the same symmetry because I'm pretty sure I'm going to get a bond. Okay. So you can look at this metal and say, all right, which orbitals on the metal point at the six ligand sigma? Anybody want to throw one out there? What's that? DZ squared. That's a good one. Z squared, if you pick it along the principal axis, which you should, points up and down here if that's Z and the donut points at four. So that probably makes a bond. Matt? Uh, the BX squared minus Y squared. That's the other D orbital that points directly at the ligands, right? The ones with the squareds. X squared minus Y squared, Z squared. Another one? Yes. S. S always makes a bond. What's the symmetry of an S orbital? Always A1. In octahedral, there's an inversion center, so it's going to be A1G. Anybody else? P orbitals. All right, so you just did it. Okay, you look at the table, and the symmetries of all those are shown. A1G. Who's T1U? The P orbitals, because it's a U, right? And U tells you they're it's anti symmetric with respect to inversion. P orbitals do that. P orbitals are not. P orbitals are symmetric with respect to inversion. And S orbital is symmetric with respect to inversion. So the metals for S orbital is A1G, the for PX, PY. D Z squared, D X squared, minus Y squared, D E. And X Z, Y Z, and X Y. Where are those guys? What are they doing? Where are those orbitals in this transition metal complex? Between the ligands, right? DZ squared and DX squared minus Y squared point at the ligands. DXZ, DYZ, DXY, they're in the spaces between the ligands. So, can you tell these three apart in this complex? No. So, what do you think the degeneracy is here that captures this? Three. Okay. They're going to be triply degenerate and transform together. And are they G or U? G, there you go. These guys are T2G. Yeah, EG and T2G. That's kind of familiar. So let's write out here the A1G symmetry MO for a second. What is that? That is an S orbital. by six ligand sigma orbitals. A1G is the S orbital. Straightforward to shape this one in because an S orbital, and we're going to draw the bonding combination here. Here we 
good. So the wave function here, one a one g, is going to be coefficient one times the four s function plus coefficient two times I'm going to say sigma one plus sigma two plus sigma three plus sigma four plus five plus sigma six. That guy's pretty straightforward. That is a delocalized sigma volume orbital. It's got some covalent character. Let's do T one U. What's T one U again? P orbitals, only one of U symmetry. Let's do this P Z orbital. What's the overlap gonna look like here? We're taking the six ligand sigmas and making combinations of them that have the same symmetry as this T1U orbital, right? T1U orbital has a node plane. Where is it? Top and bottom are different, right? Plus or minus, the ligands sit in the nodal plane. So if these are simple sigma orbitals like S orbitals, you're not going to get any kind of density there. There's a nodal plane in this molecular orbital defined by this P orbital. The ligand sigma combination that fits looks like this. Some bottom, just like the P orbital does. This nodal plane goes through the other four, so they don't contribute until you look along the X and the Y direction. There are two other ones, right? In those cases, the node goes through here and goes through here, and then you get density out there, right? So for this PZ, this T1U, it's going to be plus and minus matching the underlying P orbital. The sign of one P1U, the bonding orbital involving that P orbital is going to look like C3. Plus C4. Now we're taking sigma one and sigma four, and they are going to be opposite signs. There are three of these guys. Because X, Y, and Z are indistinguishable in this compound, these are triply degenerate. They're three separate orbitals, but they all have the same energy. They all have the same symmetry, just with different organizations. They're triply degenerate. Or a few orbitals. How about EG? What's EG again? It's a V orbital. T2G and EG in octahedral. The triply degenerate one doesn't point at the ligands. EG, the double degenerate one, does. DC squared and X squared minus Y squared point at the ligands. Let's do x squared minus y squared for a second. I want my ligand orbitals to have the same symmetry as the v orbital. Ligand that lines up with the node or with the lobe must be the same. But then the nodal structure must also translate. And these vertical bonds here, those metals, sorry, those ligands sit on two nodal planes. So you're not going to get a sigma bond. 
then you only get a sigma bond with the ones that are in the equatorial plane. Now, what about the other one? Sorry, I'm a little tilted. That is PA. That's the other half of EG. EZ squared now, X squared minus Y squared over here. These lobes along the donut have the same symmetry. These lobes along the other part of EZ squared here, they have the same sign. So this combination of ligand sigma orbitals has the same symmetry as the D orbital, as the DZ squared does. These two are part of a doubly degenerate set. And they don't really look like they sort of look distinguishable. Best thing I can do to reconcile that issue is to say they are not distinguishable. I mean, they have different, they have different, they involve different ligands and whatnot, but these are part of a doubly degenerate set. A little bit dissatisfying to say they're degenerate when they look so very different. I promise it's true. Let's draw our one EG orbital here. X squared minus Y squared. We've got our X squared minus Y squared orbital combining with some of the sigma orbitals. Now we're going to do two minus sigma two plus sigma three minus. Sigma five, I think, yeah. plus sigma six. So alternating. And the psi one EG involving the DZ squared is going to be C7 squared C8. We're taking the top. The bottom, I'm making a plus overlap here, and then we're going to have the uh, minus C9 <clears throat> sigma two plus sigma three sigma five. So these all form an antibonding sort of or have the opposite sign as one and four. Fun fact, my drawing doesn't show it. Which of the coefficients eight or nine is larger? I sort of think about this donut and these two things as being equivalent to the plus and the minus of the two sigma sets. So they sort of make up equal amounts of the orbital. But this one shared with four, and this one shared with two. So I would say C8 is greater than C9. Basically, the bond to the donut, these interactions are a little bit on a per ligand basis, a little bit weaker than this one's Why in the x squared minus y squared is there only C C6 and then there's plus or minus, but in the z squared you have C8 and C9? Like when do you know when to make two coefficients and when to group them together? Well, this is just a symbols representation of this drawing. I don't find the drawing that confusing. The symbols don't mean a lot to me, honestly. Mm -hmm. What I see is that these guys have the same sign here. Let's see, there's six ligand to orbital bases there, but this one, there's only four involved. These guys don't contribute because they're falling on the nodes of that group. Okay? So this one, you're only having four, and here you've got six. So in order to get this sort of a phase relationship, that's how you would. Is it just like a property of DZ squared that C8 and C9 can be different, where in C6, the coefficient for sigma 2 and sigma 3 would be the same, even though they're opposite signs? I think the answer to your question is yes. Okay, so like in 
x squared minus y squared, that's just not going to occur where there will be different contributions from the plus and the minus side. Yeah, you just want the ligand signals to have the same phase as the orbital to which they're in, which, yeah. which they're overlapping. Right. And this is the shape of the mean squared orbital. And so to get that overlap, you have to have this symmetry. Think about what, what is the node of this thing look like? Like a pair of intersecting cones, right? Think of it's like a single plane or something that's circular. Right? It comes down in, into this thing. So if you consider the symmetry of that D orbital, you can see how these guys are the same sign. Those guys are the same sign. But that's just a property of the easy square that looks like. All right, now, what about T2G? What does T2G look like? Oh, yeah. Okay, where are the nodes? Uh, so there would be one like this, and then like this. You consider the Yeah, another way to say it is that the nodes are on the leads. The lobes are between them. Our nodes running right along the ligands. All of the ligands fall on the nodes of T2G. And that's why they're not bonding. They do not have the same combination, right? So six ligand sigma does not have T2G in it. So your T2G orbital cannot have any overlap with the ligands. There are three of these also. Is this direction Z? Yeah. You don't know, I do mark it on here. Usually I do that, right? This would be Z. But this could be X or it could be Y. You can't tell the three apart, they're indistinguishable. Not to be both. Depends on the other. That's why in Z directions and not to the three apart. That's why there are three of these that are indistinguishable. There are also three of these. You can label it X, Y, or Z and you get the same result. All right. So next time, we'll go back and finish our molecular orbital diagram here based on this six lead sigma and all of these technologies. And then we're almost done with molecular orbital theory. Okay, so. Yeah. See you. Uh,